going to talk a little bit this morning about three different projects that I have going on uh, within uh, the Ag Econ Department uh, on hemp, specifically related to hemp uh, and hemp projects. Uh, so not all of it is exactly farm uh, at the farm level, but uh, we've got some interesting projects going on. So I I'm going to jump right into this and we're going to talk about uh, exactly what Tom was talking about and how does hemp compare to some of the other crops. Um, I hear a lot about well, it's going to replace tobacco and some other things, but when we really look at some of uh, the crops I think it's really going to compete with, I think it's going to be corn and beans um, and, and plant in that space, uh, specifically on the fiber and on the grain side. So, and I'll talk a little bit about the CBD side of things. I know that's what the majority of the production is in the state, and we're still working on several things uh, to go with that. But so, how does how does hemp returns compare? So, to kind of get at this, we've we set up a, um, a model to, to simulate what might happen. And to kind of give you a little bit of background on this, um, as far as grain prices, we're looking at grain prices somewhere between 65 cents and 75 cents. And there's an escalator in there for if you're over a certain yield, uh, price goes up. Okay? Fiber side, we're looking at somewhere between 5 cents and 10 cents. Um, grain yields, we're looking at 600 pounds an acre up to 1,500 pounds an acre. You can argue with me on, on whether or not I'm high or low. Um, on the fiber side, we're looking at somewhere between 4,000 pounds and 12,000 pounds, so between basically two ton and six ton. Uh, granted, this right here is going to be a little high, uh, but I think we're getting there, and um, hopefully Dr. Williams and, and a few others, their research is showing that we're, we're getting closer to that type of number. Okay. Input costs, we'll run those off the UK budget. Poly cost, I'm pulling those in as well. Now, one thing I do have in here that uh, some others may not think about. Uh, when I go through and I look at all these reports, and I will say Doris and them have done a fabulous job of getting the reports and stuff up, and there's a summary report, and it talks about what is the main, uh, some of the main issues we're having with this crop, and one of them is crop failure. So I've got it set up in here that there's a 20% chance of crop failure. It's probably maybe closer to 35, 40, 50% in terms of crop failure. So and that's just due to weed pressure and, and so on and so forth within the fiber and seed varieties out there. So keep that in mind. And then I'm really looking at comparing those to corn and soybeans and return above variable cost uh, for these uh, for these crops. So when I look at this, uh, this is basically a budget for uh, grain and fiber. So and this is what my expected values are, what the average would be. So that's 70 cents. There's my eight cents about 6,400 pounds and about 786 pounds on the, the grain side of things. A couple things to take note of is there's quite a bit of difference in the number of pounds per seed for the fiber side versus the grain side. And in some cases, you're gonna see the price for the fiber side be a little higher, okay, for some of the seed. A couple other things. You're gonna look at the fiber side, I'm estimating somewhere around $41 loss per acre, okay? And that's kind of what I would expect. And I think as we get better breeding programs and domestic seed comes into production, as we get a better understanding of how many pounds per acre of seed we need, some of this is gonna correct itself and we're gonna get back to a better number here. Um, on the grain side of things, I'm looking at about a six, six dollar uh, per acre return above variable cost, so fairly above break even. Okay. And then I tried to put this in a graph so it makes it a little easier to understand. And the main point I want to make of this, the red line is fiber, the black line is grain. There's tremendous variability. So I'm looking at potentially a, a $600 an acre loss all the way to a $600 an acre gain. Okay. That is tremendous variability in this market. A lot of this is a result of there's no crop insurance. There's no safety net in that, and there's still a lot of unknowns taking taking place within this market. Okay, um, and it also shows up in here that 20% loss or 20% uh, um, chance of failure. So the one thing that when I get producers that call and ask me, do I want to get in this? Are you willing to lose, and can you lose $600 an acre? If you can, then okay. But if you can't afford to do that, it may not be a crop for you. Okay? That's just the point blank honest um, economic side of that. But 
Uh, according to my model, I'm looking at about a 50% chance of having positive return over variable costs for fiber and about a oh, almost a 65% chance of positive return on the green side of things. Okay. Now, I know that these are not the two main crops, so we're looking at CBD as the majority of the crop in the state, but um, these are the easier ones to get to get my hands wrapped around and to get uh, a better understanding of what's going on within these markets. You compare those to corn and beans, these are 2018 numbers, these are kind of what I'm expecting uh, in terms of returns for those, and you can see the returns for those are, are pretty, uh, not near as much variability in those markets, okay? Cost of CBD production. This one, I still have not been able to get my head wrapped around. We have the, the types of contracts that are out there are not converging to any sort of number yet. Production percent to CBD in each of the varieties is not really converging yet. Uh, we're trying to get uh, a better understanding of that, but before I put one up here, I want to have it vetted and, and a few other things um, to, to at least know that I'm, I'm heading in the right direction. And right now, I don't know that uh, the numbers I have are uh, are going to tell any sort of picture at all. So it's kind of where we're at on that. Be, uh, be looking forward to, to what's coming out there. Okay, so some final thoughts on that. Tremendous variability, uh, as you can see in the graph. Commodity markets, I expect these to turn into commodity markets. The financial market is, I think, a real problem. Um, my wife works in the banking sector, and if you were to go and ask her for a loan, she's basically going to tell you, well, what other collateral and what other crops you're growing, and are you profitable in those? If you're profitable in those, I'll I'll give you some money for those, but I don't know that we're going to touch him, right? So um, domestic seed production as it comes along, uh, I think will help on the cost of production side. And on the fixed cost side, I haven't included any fixed costs in this model yet. So that machinery costs and some of those other things that need to go in there. So if you're at six bucks, you're probably going to be less than zero, right? So that's kind of what I'm expecting. A second project. Where might this actually be grown at? And I'm kind of, this is a really exciting project that one of my grad students has taken on. Um, it's under an NSF project, so. And we're gathering a lot of data uh, from across the state. And, uh, it'll make a little more sense here in a few minutes when I get to, uh, to some of the graphics. But we're using the cropland data layer along with a lot of NAS data and common data uh, and the common data layer uh, and graphing this and what we're actually able to do is we're actually able to get down to the field scale. So at the field level, I can tell what crop was being produced in that field. We're using satellite imagery uh, to, to get what crop was being produced in that. So I've got the main crops we have in the state. So winter wheat, tobacco, corn, uh, soybeans, and alfalfa. Just pulled out an example of Simpson County here. And you can kind of see the var variation, a lot of it's corn and beans, as I would expect. But one thing that I'm hoping some of the research in this room is going to lead to is where does hemp fit at in the rotation, right? And the reason I say that, and I think it may become even more evident or needed in the future, is that as we continue to have budgetary issues at the federal level, potentially our safety nets continue to come down, producers are going to continue to look for other crops to fit into that rotation to, to help with diversification. Hemp could be one of them. So how is it going to play into that corn soybean rotation? Where is it going to fit at in that cycle and what, uh, what happens with yields uh, within, that, within that space for each of those different crops? So I'm hoping somebody can answer that question for me um, in the coming years. So. Okay. So basically what we're doing is we're meshing this data, so the crop production data, with lots of data on slope, soil types, um, elevations, trying to get at production um, and precipitation, what, what we're expecting in terms of how we predict what crop is coming next. Okay? And because I'm an economist, I have to have some sort of equation in here that just uh, justifies my existence, I think. So, we, we did put an equation here, and basically all we're doing is looking at probability, okay? So what's the probability that one crop's gonna come after another? Well, a couple of interesting things. This is exactly what we would expect to see, right? A corn soybean rotation. So if you had corn one year, the next year we would expect it to go to soybeans. If you had soybeans, you would expect it to go to corn, right? So we're getting the rotations to start to show up in there. Now we're trying to slide in hemp 
into this. And so how does that uh, play in there? And this is one piece that we don't have totally, uh, totally all pulled together yet, but once uh, some of the agronomists and, and crop science <coughs> individuals can tell us how this is gonna fit in there, we can modify this matrix uh, to, get, to get a better representation and add hemp into this graphic, okay? We expect the same thing. I don't know that I expect much acres to come out of alfalfa, but um, might be a possibility. Tobacco, we would expect the same tobacco after tobacco. So the rotation's there, um, it's what we expect. We just gotta be able to get hemp pulled into this. Okay. And I'm sure all of you love USDA surveys, right? So we get a, a USDA survey, we get asked about what our crop production is gonna be for the year, and then the market moves tremendously when they come out with those reports, right? This is gonna be hopefully one way that we can subsidize or maybe do a better job of helping them understand some of those numbers because we can actually put a distribution to this. So this is for corn for the state of Kentucky. Uh, we have something a little over 1 million acres of corn, 1.2 million acres of corn uh, in the state on average. And we're looking at our distribution and it's, it's um, on average, we're, we're estimating that distribution back. So it tells me our model is, is operating pretty well, uh, that we're able to get back what we'd expect. I know we're a little short on the tobacco acreage, but that's a function of I've got a few counties that are missing, uh, a few major tobacco producing counties that are missing uh, that we're trying to get data on as well. So, but we're getting there. Uh, I've been pretty happy with this. Uh, I'm kind of curious to see what the distribution looks like for hemp once we actually get it put in there. Okay. And then we also have this very large other. So this is all the other crops produced in the state uh, that we have information on as well, which may be another place where hemp comes into play. Okay. Um, I'm always asked, well, where, where do I think hemp production is going to be? Maybe this is a popular state, maybe it's an unpopular statement. But if Iowa and the I states open up uh, hemp production and let it go, um, let it really go, they're going to be the grain producers, in my opinion. They're going to be the producers of grain. Okay? And that's purely because they have the soil types, uh, they're going to have the yields and, and a few other things. Where do I think Kentucky fits in? Tom kind of hit it, the nail on the head earlier when he talked about forage production. I think the fiber side is really a, an area where Kentucky could, could be a player at. We've always been a forage producing state, and I think that that, that may be an opportunity in the future. Okay? So I think fiber will be produced in, in Kentucky and, and maybe Tennessee and a few others, but if the Midwest really opens up grain, I think that's where the grain side's gonna go. Okay? So the last project that we're working on is moving completely away from the farm and we're moving more towards, well, what are consumers? So we all talk about, well, we can produce it, but who's gonna consume all this stuff? You know, where's, where, where's it gonna go? So we've been trying to, to pull a data set uh, together uh, and we're using this Nielsen data set. It's a, it's a large national data set, so the numbers that you're gonna see in this are reflecting national levels. And we've got it from 2008 to 2015. So we've got a lot of data pre-14 Farm Bill and one year afterwards. Um, <coughs> the downside of this is this data set operates on a two year lag. So 16 numbers will be coming in at some point in time later this year. So we'll be able to add those to it. Uh, so we'll at least have two years worth of data after uh, the 14 Farm Bill. Okay. But a couple things to notice. So the quantity of hemp products sold by region. So we've got this, the country broken down into the Northeast, Midwest, the South, and the West. Um, interestingly enough, we're starting to see tremendous growth, and especially right here, 13, 14, 15, in the amount of nuts or grain that's entering the market. We've got some information on nutrition. We've got some information on protein. Um, the curious thing to look at this about is where are regions in the country that do or don't have certain products, right? And that's what we're trying to get at is, is certain areas of the country that have access to certain products and some that don't. Granola um, is by far the, the largest, um, has the largest amount of data within our data set. Um, one other thing I should note, note about this is within this data set, products that have hemp in them may have 1% or they may have 100%. So I don't have any designation as to the percentage of hemp. I would love to know that number, right? Because then I could back into what the demand 
at the farm level would be, but we're not there yet. Um, and I know I know this data set is missing uh, quite a few things, especially on the CBD oil side of things. If anybody knows of a data set that I can get at where I can find that type of information, I would love to talk with you and, and figure out how we can we can work together on that project. Okay. Um, then I can break it down. Uh, I'm going to guess that hemp soft drinks or, or soft drinks that contained hemp. Uh, there was a few of them that lasted for a few years and then uh, nobody liked them anymore. Okay, um, but we're starting to see some some trends. Uh, cereal has, has had a peak and now it's come back down. And these are just a number of products that have it uh, in them, have hemp in them. Um, when you get down here into we are able to capture some of those uh, pharma or uh, health and beauty aid products that are in this. So that's kind of one of the interesting things. And I guess if you want to know a little bit more about where this data comes from, if you think about how many of you have a Kroger card, that's where this comes from, right? This is data that's being collected on Kroger cards, Whole Foods, you know, it's scanner. <coughs> so what's actually being purchased? So, so we do know uh, a little bit about you. Okay? <coughs> So getting you more into the results. And I've really only, I've tried to break this down into to a couple of key things. So as I would have expected um, for the cereal and nut side of things, and I would have really expected this for the nutrition and protein side of things, but I think nutrition and protein side of things aren't showing up significant because there's not as many observations in the data set as there are for the, for the cereal and the nuts. But as I would have expected, Medium income, so 30,000 plus in income, are the main consumers of products that contain hemp, right? So 30,000 to 70,000 in high income would be 70,000 and above, okay? So interestingly enough though, the medium income producers have a higher number in terms of consumption of cereal, and it's vice versa in terms of nuts. So it's kind of an interesting uh, uh, finding that we're looking at, okay? One other thing from a marketing standpoint that we're thinking about is age. So, and these are relative to uh, the younger groups, so less than 30, I believe. So, if you're over 30, you're less likely to purchase these products, which I find kind of interesting, okay? Because folks that are less than 30 may not always be those higher income individuals, okay? So we're starting to think about and, and look at some of that. Um, married status played a little bit of a role, a negative for the nuts, but a positive for the nutrition. We're still trying to parse out what, uh, what's, what's playing some of these impacts. Education is another big one that we thought about. Um, and I think this is really where that younger generation comes in. Uh, as you get more and more educated, you seem to have a stronger propensity uh, to purchase products with him, and especially moving into this protein and nutrition side of things. So um, maybe this could be some sort of movement like we saw with Chia and, and a few other products as well. So uh, that's one possibility. Um, one really interesting finding is that the Asian side or the Asian variable is actually negative. That's not what I would have expected given that uh, Southeast Asia, especially Korea and a few others, are some of the biggest consumers in the world of these products. Okay? So I would have expected them to consume those products here too, just as they do at home. So that's what leads us back to this idea of is, is it access to these types of products that they want. So uh, that's why we're breaking it down and trying to look at it by region um, and trying to figure out what, they're at, what they actually do and don't have access to. Okay? Um, the last one is the, the uh, um, location variables or the regional variables. So all this could be interpreted as relative to the Northeast. So I would assume that the Northeast and the West would probably be the two bigger consumers. And as you would expect, the West uh, is a bigger consumer. Uh, it's more likely to consume than the Northeast except for nutrition and protein, which I don't totally understand other than I think that, again, we're, they don't have as, as much access uh, to products out there as they do in the Northeast. Um, but it's positive for the South, for nuts, but we don't like a lot of nutrition <coughs> and, and, and 
serial side of things, maybe this is a function of we some of the, have some of the highest obesity rates in the country. I don't know. We're just uh, we're, we're thinking about what all is going on there and why certain things are playing out the way they are. Uh, the last variable that we kind of put in here that was of kind of interest is: is there hemp legislation in your state or not? Okay. We see it has a positive impact on cereal, but not on on the nut side of things, which I, which uh, we can't really explain that other than most, maybe most of it's still coming out of Canada, so they're not worried about where that's coming from. So we're still trying to understand some of these variables uh, as we find them. So kind of in summary for that, we're still seeing, uh, still expecting sales to increase. Income, age, race, religion are all playing key determinants. Um, and we can, we can dig down a little deeper in terms of some of the marketing potential uh, uh, for some of these products. Changing mix of what consumers are purchasing, we're seeing that take place. And this is only a limited <coughs> picture of the whole market. As I mentioned, we don't have anything on the CBD side and the whole side. Um, I think there is one data set out there that might have some, some leads. Uh, and if anybody works with uh, the SPINS data set and has contacts there, I would love to, to talk with you about that and maybe how we get access to that. Um, if you read the Hemp Business Journal, um, it's cited in there all the time, but it's a very proprietary data set. Um, so we're trying to get, trying to get a, a our, we're trying to work with them to use that data set. And then we still need to understand this is all about quantities and how much is being purchased. We haven't got into the side yet that really matters, and that's how much are they spending. Okay, so we haven't got into the expenditures that people are outlaying on that because then that translates back to profitability. Okay. So some final thoughts. Um, we're still working on uh, several different research areas. A more detailed cost of production. Uh, hopefully we're going to continue to do that. How hemp fits into the rotation. I think one thing um, that we're missing out on and, and don't have a real good understanding is the storage cost of hemp. So I mean, how much degradation do we have of these products once they hit storage? And how does that value change? So how quickly do we have to move them in and out of storage? Because storage of these crops, especially on the grain side, and probably even on the floral side, are significantly different than what a lot of our producers are used to using. Okay. Risk management, we've got zero risk management tools. I'm kind of curious to see, um, we had the big announcement about they're putting forward the, the hemp legislation. If that goes through, does that open up some risk management opportunities? So things like uh, NAP or the non non-commodity crops, does that open up that type of insurance uh, for these producers to get their hands on? It, it's not gonna happen overnight. It's gonna take some time. What are consumer expenditures, transport and cleaning costs of these products, economies of scale? So how big do we actually have to be? Data, domestic seed production, and then you can throw in access to chemicals, um, insecticides, and and one curious question I have is, how many acres of hemp production have to be actually produced for a chemical company to actually entertain the idea of thinking about labeling this? Okay. What, what makes, how many acres do you have to have to make the R&D worth it? So that's a good question. Uh, maybe somebody has that answer. Uh, I tried to do a little bit of, of legwork on that to, to see if I could find any literature on it, and I haven't yet. So. All right, that's kind of where we're at on the econ side of things. We have a lot of, different projects going, more to come.